Okay, fasten your seat belts. Don't blink. <laughs> because you're going to miss something here. I'm going to go through this very quickly. We're going to start with principles. Um, a lot of missions are beginning to realize this kind of reality. You can increase income, you can increase productivity, you can increase supply, and yet not have impact on nutrition outcomes. If there's a message to what I'm going to talk about in the next 9.5 minutes, it's that we all, it's a, the onus is on us all to validate our own theories of change. We really have to be more evidence-based in what we are promoting and connect the dots, not assume linear connections, linear relationships between A and B. What do we do to address nutrition? There's lots of ways, there's not one way, and what is the evidence currently? Currently, there's a lot of growing evidence around impacts on nutrition. Already ten year, uh, three years ago, four years ago, there was a World Bank effort and an effort of many people to understand the impact through systematic reviews, meta-analyses of targeted nutrition interventions, and through modeling exercises derived the understanding that with a set of known interventions like vitamin A supplementation or iron and folate supplementation, you could reduce stunting by 20%. And that was just recently in the late, most recent Lancet series reconfirmed that 10 known targeted nutrition specific interventions can reduce stunting by 20%. Great, except that's just 20%. All right, so we now have to figure out, well, what else? We, we need to do these 10, we need to go to scale, we need to target, we need universal coverage, we need to prevent and treat, but it's still only 20%. Oh, maybe it's 30%. We'll see in different contexts. So 20% is the average, the range is from 11 to 30%. What else has to be done? Well, we also know that doubling per capita income across countries and across time, temporal periods, can re is associated with a reduction of about 15% of stunting. So po reducing poverty matters, and there's lots of ways of doing that. And especially income from agriculture, doubling income per capita from agricultural sources actually has an even bigger impact on stunting for obvious reasons that most stunted people are in rural areas, depend on ag agriculture. So if you double agriculture income per capita, you'll get more impact on stunting. So we need to do this. This is good. So, but it's still only 20%. So right now we're looking at 40%. Most of the problem we're focused on still unresolved. Let that sink in, right? This matters that we know these numbers and we have to take actions accordingly. Now, it means that there's a lot of other stuff we need to know. And so the nutrition labs uh, are also involved in more of the, they're involved in cost effectiveness studies, program implementation studies, but also scientific, biological science studies. For example, I'm not going to elaborate, Jeff is going to go into the gut microbiome research which links across multiple uh, innovation labs, maybe 43, maybe 40% of stunting could be associated with gut microbiome issues. So we need to look at wash and hygiene. Uh, but beyond that, at, at how nutrients uh, are potentially absorbed. We'd heard about aflatoxins just now. From Dave, uh, there are associative studies that, that is, say, see about 34, 37, 40% of stunting associated with high levels of aflatoxin through dietary sources. So we have to really take this seriously because this is tropics wide, uh, the problem of aflatoxin on multiple crops. New work by, uh, by Yale, by Spears on village level sanitation, maybe 45% of the total stunting difference globally could be explained by open defecation, high population density, high interaction, and environmental enteropathy. All of these things, therefore, are potential contributors. So if you do a simple thought experiment, we need to take into account that nutrition-specific interventions, about which we know quite a lot, uh, could perhaps resolve 10 to 30% of the problem. All right, that's, that's a start. We know that poverty reduction at the macro level and specific agricultural income growth matters just as much. It's, a, it's something we have to add to that. 
we're not entirely clear what then the contribution of other domains interacting with improved wash, reducing open defecation, improving diet quality, not just mycotoxins but other forms. There's a range of things that need to be better understood to be able to say we be able to claim we are having impact on stunting reduction. Not just claim it, but accelerate it and have it acting at scale, not just among certain subpopulations. So we know there's a lot to do, but we don't yet know what are optimal combinations of agriculture, nutrition, and other forms of interventions. They're unknown. We don't have the evidence. We are, have poor documentation currently of, of how to take things from small pilot trial level to large scale population coverage. And cost effectiveness remains a big black box, the real cost effectiveness of com combinations. And these are domains that need attention. So the innovation labs are addressing three major domains, uh, as Jeff mentioned, trying to empirically populate what we know about agriculture to nutrition pathways. Identify areas where we can fill in the gaps of knowledge, we can deal with neglected biological mechanisms, Jeff will talk about that, and also then programming policy and cost effectiveness studies. For example, in Nepal, the blue is the large Suhara program, integrated nutrition program, the, the hashed is the Feed the Future program that, that is just up and going. But these aren't the only integrated programs uh, in or coming to Nepal. There's a Thousand Golden Days activity which covers a large area. We're about to hear the uh, Nepal government's own multi-sector nutrition plan. These are the rollout, the initial districts for rolling out. And there are more. So what we are doing, and I'm just using Nepal as the example, is a series of studies to try and address all three of those major bullets. We have research sites that are ra uh, randomly selected, a uh, stratified random sample of 21 sites, plus four additional sites around the country, that will help us capture the exposure to and uptake of innovations from the two large U USAID-funded programs, as well as other World Bank, European Union, national government multi-sector plans. So these sites are going to be, over time, they're panel-based, longitudinal cohort panel-based, uh, repeat annual surveys. So we have Johns Hopkins and NTAG and the National Ag Research Group uh, looking at what is going on in agriculture to nutrition uh, across these different agroecologies. We have links with Virginia Tech and Heifer in certain areas looking at RCTs for pro animal source protein quality impacts on nutrition and cognitive development. We have Harvard working with the Institute of Medicine looking at dietary change in peri-urban parts of, of Nepal and how that links over time with mother and infant pairs and their outcomes. And then there's Tufts ourselves uh, working closely with USAID and HKI and others uh, looking at those 21 same sites as the initial uh, 21, looking above what's happening at the community level, but what's happening in terms of implementation by program implementers and policymakers at each level. And by the way, the two field trips are going to those two sites, if you were actually wondering. Very quickly, many of you, if not all of you, have been <laughs> swamped with the nutrition pathways. There's lots of boxes and lots of arrows. We know very little about many of those arrows. They are conceptual. And there's many ways that you can re go from A to nutrition outcomes. But there's lots of things that can happen in the meantime, whether it's design effects or poor implementation effects, or trade-offs at the household level that prevent that. But there are also ways around it. What we need to do in different agroecologies at different contexts is try and understand the nature, the characteristics of the households in different places, uh, and the outcomes that are associated. Across, this is work that NASA and Purdue has been doing, looking at the association of crop yields. Well, you can have crop yields that are above average at a district level across Nepal with below average nutrition outcomes. You can have the opposite. You can have below average crop yields and above average nutrition outcomes. We need to understand why. What's going on here? What are the drivers of this? And all right, let, what's the association then? We, have, we talked briefly about crop diversity. 
and diet diversity. Just a simple uh, traffic light thing. The top one is always crop diversity, the bottom one diet diversity. So if it's green, it's above average for that agroecology. And I thank Sweta Manohar here from the Johns Hopkins for generating these data. So if it's above average crop diversity, it's green. If it's above average diet diversity, it's green. So you see a number of places where above average both are, are linked. Below average both can be linked. But of course, inevitably, there are places where high crop diversity is not associated with high diet diversity. And the opposite, yep, high crop diversity or low crop diversity may not be associated with high diet diversity. We need to understand that some, it's not just agroecology. Some of these are high uh, hills and mountains, others are terrain. High crop diversity can be a factor in the mountains because people are diversifying risk. And in the low, it, it, low crop diversity in the Terai can be simply because people are specializing and in, get, engaging in high productivity. These are the kinds of things we need to tease out, understand, explain, and then use in figuring out what's the best way to implement. I'm not going to go into the biological mechanisms because that's what uh, Jeff is, is going to talk about. But a great push, we need to know very much about what bun bundles matter, what combinations work most cost effectively per unit of nutrition gained. And there are many ways of measuring that. And can we imp uh, empirically measure quality of implementation process to better understand not just product and delivery mechanisms, but the capacity gaps that need to be addressed to achieve uh, large scale uptake. So these. This kind of widespread research represents a platform that many of you can also link to. You can ask questions that we may be able to, to answer given this research design. And we'll be testing, validating new tools, looking at cost very closely. Basically, we are open for collaboration with as many partners as possible and hopefully achieving the linkages across interests that we were talking about earlier. Thank you. To learn more about scaling and how you can contribute to this growing body of knowledge, please visit agrilinks.org slash scaling.